la la. Actually, I love to talk about this next thing, and that is our fungi. First of all, it's such a crazy word to say, you're like, fungi. Like, ah ya. I don't know. I guess I like ninjas, so maybe, uh, whatever. Anyways, um, fungi is really cool. There's a lot of cool things to it, so we're going to talk about that right now. It is its own kingdom, which is kind of cool. So, yes, today is the day. And she's so excited. Are you so excited? Because, yeah, we're going to discuss. Well, you see, I know the suspense is killing you. No, not really, because I already told you. Okay? We're going to talk about the kingdom fungi and animalia. But that's going to be in another part. Okay? So, be prepared, because that will be following shortly after the kingdom fungi. All right. Don't get too excited. But let's kind of talk a little bit about things. So, First of all, the kingdom, kingdom fungi, when we talk about fungi, they evolved 600 million years ago from protist ancestors. 600 million years. Can you even fathom that? That's crazy. So they've been around for a long time. Okay? They are multicellular, most of them. There's one that I'll talk about that's unicellular. And most are eukaryotes. Okay? Um, they're heterotrophs, so they actually make their own food, just like us, but in a little different way. Watch this. When we talk about a saprotrophic, they we're talking about the fact that they obtain their food from the decaying bodies of plants and animals. Mmm, yummy. No, that's not really us, right? We don't we are heterotrophs, we actually go and get our food, but we don't actually feed off the decaying bodies of others. That would be pretty gross, like maggots and stuff. No, not so much. They also can be parasitic, so they can feed on other living things, such as your eyeball actually lots of places. So if anybody's ever had athlete's foot, ringworm, there's all sorts of, sorts of fungi that you can get on your skin and they actually live on your skin and feed off of that. Mm. Tasty, right? You guys wish that you had me for anatomy because I have lots of gross pictures to show you then. So um, they're also mutualistic in a way where some of them can live um, in harmony with others. A mutualistic relationship is where basically um, both parties that are involved, the fungi and whatever else, um, typically are not being harmed. They are actually um, helping each other. So they can have these two parasitic or mutualistic um, forms of symbiosis. Okay? Fungi are not plants. They are not in the kingdom plantae. They are their own kingdom. So don't, don't just put them in that category, otherwise they might cry or something. They're also non-photosynthetic. They do not do photosynthesis. They do not contain chlorophyll. They're typically never green, so they're not going to undergo photosynthesis. Got it? Okay, good. They're also non-modal. They're not going to move, okay? So they're not going to, like, get up and walk around unless there's some crazy thing carrying it, like an ant or something. But, no, they are non-modal. They stay in one place, okay? Um, yeasts are the only unicellular fungi, okay? So when I said most of them are are multicellular. The only one that is unicellular are yeasts, which we know a lot about yeast. Yeasts have helped us bake over the years, okay? They help bread rise. It's actually, we're actually using that specific yeast, that fungi, um, and to aid us in cooking, but also there's many other um, types of, like, you can get a yeast infection. Um, so there's many different, not, I'm not going to say many different types, but yeast can come in all different areas and um, be helpful or harmful consist of thread-like structures called hyphae. So when you see these little, um, sometimes you'll see, and I'm going to have lots of pictures to show you. It's like one big slideshow. But you're going to notice that some fungi is very filamentous. Like there's lots of filaments, okay? If that's even a word, filamentous. Ah, I just made it up. But those are called hyphae, okay? The body of it is called the mycelium. And I'll show you another picture coming up that gives you a better um, picture of that. The cell walls of fungi are made of chitin, which is a very specific substance, specific to fungi. Okay, it's kind of a, it's not necessarily a hard material, but it can be because um, some, even some insects, uh, some other exoskeletons are made of chitin, but um, they can withstand kind of very harsh conditions. Okay, they store food as glycogen, kind of like us. Um, we store energy, like. Uh, Carbohydrates, basically compo co complex carbohydrates in our body are stored as glycogen, and fungi tend to do the same thing, okay? They're classified based on the type of reproductive spores they reproduce, or they produce. So that's a big thing, is I want you guys to understand that there are many different um, 
many different classes of fungi that I'm going to show you guys, and they're basically separated because of the way they reproduce, okay, and basically based on the spores. They lack true roots, stems, or leaves, which obviously negates them from the, the kingdom plantae, okay, so they are not plants. All right, hyphae, let's go back to the hyphae. Um, these hyphae are these, you know, filamentous kind of um, structures that are part of the fungi. So you can see that the hyphae contain stolons, which are horizontal hyphae that connect groups of hyphae to each other. And then rhizoids are root-like parts of the hyphae that anchor the fungus. So the rhizoids are kind of the things that would be underground that basically hold them in place, where the hyphae can kind of be, um, you know, something that looks like this that kind of extends it, but also it depends on what the actual fungi looks like that can dictate what the hyphae might look like. Let's hear some more pictures, okay? So in a typical mushroom or fungi that we're used to seeing, um, you see the hyphae that could actually run up through the actual um, kind of the fruiting portion of that fungi. And then hyphae can also run down here, but also this is considered the mycelium, which is the root kind of portion, but it's not a true root, but it's kind of their anchoring system, okay? Um, you can see some of the hyphae that is um, just kind of that stringy-like looking thing, so that's it. But also the hyphae can run up through these um, stems, even though they're not real stems, because remember they don't contain true stem roots and leaves. All right, so three types of asexual reproduction that occur in fungi. We have fragmentation, which is part of the mycelium becomes separated, and it begins a life of its own. Wouldn't that be nice? Just all of a sudden a part of you breaks off, and all of a sudden you have a new you. Oh, lovely. No, that'd be kind of weird. You know, like, I, well, I don't want my arm to break off, and I don't definitely don't want that arm growing into a new me. Um, so, obviously, fragmentation. Budding is a small cell forms and gets pinched off as it grows to full size. So kind of like a picture like this where you have a normal size cell and it just pinches off to form a little cute bud. Um, but that's what happens in yeast. Okay, so again, yeast are those unicellular um, uh, fungi. So they, they reproduce by budding. And then you have asexual spores. So the production of spores by a single mycelium. That's typically the most common um, in the fungi, but you'll see all of these occurring, okay? Now, reproduce by spores. Um, when we talk about the spores, spores may be formed. Sometimes they form directly on the hyphae, something like that. Sometimes in a sporangia, which would be kind of like the penicillium here. And then this animita, amanita, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more because it's kind of an interesting, cool, poisonous mushroom. Um, but you see the spores are actually occurring directly on, oh, I'm sorry, I mixed up these two. So basically here's, uh, here's inside the sporangium and then this is uh, the penicillin is where um, the spores are forming on the actual hyphae itself. But sorry, so the spores on this particular one are directly on that fruiting body, okay? So different places for the spores, different ways of producing, okay? Now remember I told you they were classified based on their method of reproduction. So um, I'm gonna go over these ever so briefly. There's different phylums. You have the Chiotridiomycota, you have the phylum Zygomycota, Ascomycota, and Basidiomycota. I'm gonna go over these just briefly so you know a little bit about each of those different phylums. Again, based on the method of their reproduction. So the first one, Chiotridiomycota. These are called chytrids for short, okay? They produce modal spores, kind of crazy, right? So these spores actually move. They're like, yeah, I'm gonna reproduce, woo! Um, mostly saprobes, so they feed off of decaying material, okay? And parasites. Sometimes they live in aquatic habitats and they, um, they will, typically a parasite is going to harm their host, so whatever they kind of get their nutrients on, uh, you know, on or what they're, what they're attached to or whatever, they could do some harm. They actually biodegrade and recycle nutrients. So there are some good things to this. Um, but there is a type of chytrid that has um, attacked potatoes. So some of these can be very parasitic and harm lots of different types of um, fruits, vegetables, you name it. Um, you'll see I mentioned something that's actually in your text coming up. Um, the phylum zygomycota 
um, is basically what we've seen on like moldy bread. Okay, so we call that the black bread mold, which is called a rhizopus. Um, so most of you guys have seen that before, where if you leave a piece of bread out, and usually it's not just out, it could be um, packaged up that sometimes it's in a dark place, because molds um, and uh, fungi in general, they grow in very dark, moist places, okay? Um, that's what they kind of feed off of. So the hyphae extend into the bread for nourishment, clearly, so that's why they kind of, you know, overtake and it looks all crazy and furry and stuff. Sometimes it's blue and green and pretty stuff. Okay, but asexual reproduction, um, stalked sporangia are produced that release haploid spores. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into that in detail. That's kind of uh, higher level biology, but um, just that's a little bit about the reproduction. They're commonly called molds, also called blights. Um, they can grow rapidly. And um, I know, oops, gosh, I don't like when that happens. Um, there was something called, I, I forgive me because I'm not a history buff, um, but I think it also talks about it in your lesson, but there were some, definitely some crazy things that happened back in the day. I think there was a great potato blight um, where basically there was a huge famine due to this particular mold that um, killed so much of the crop, and I think it was in Germany. And so um, these Germans fled to the U.S., because of this potato blight. I think that, I could be wrong, but check your um, check your lesson because it talks about some of those and it's kind of cool to know the history and that it definitely coincides with science. All right, so mm, here's some more pictures of the rhizopus. We've all seen them on strawberries. Strawberries seem to go bad pretty quickly. Um, the fungi and the, the mold, this particular mold, um, grows very rapidly, especially on um, some fruits like strawberries. Okay, so the phylum Ascomycota, we call these the sac fungi. These fungi include yeast, morels, truffles, cup fungi, powdery mildews, and the fungi that causes chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease. So again, um, some, sometimes having that parasitic uh, relationship where they are harming, okay? Um, in sexual reproduction, typically eight ascospores are produced in the sac or ascus, okay? And um, here's kind of something interesting. Now, I didn't know a lot about these, but I think it was in France, and it still is in France. Um, truffles, not the truffles that I'm used to thinking of, like the yummy chocolate truffles. No, 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 no. Truffles are an absolute delicatessen, and they have dogs, I believe, dogs, that sniff these truffles out. Here's a picture of a truffle and a morel. Oh, actually, these are the morels. Um, these are truffles, and they these truffles are delicatessens. I mean, they're very expensive. They're very hard to find. Um, but I believe they're found in France, and it's kind of cool. I did some research on it. Of course, I've kind of forgotten some of the stuff that um, I researched because that was months ago. But it's very cool to realize that, like, you know, something that looks, first of all, like a big log of poo, but um, is something that's so expensive and so exquisite. Now, I've never had one, um, but I'd like to try one just for the heck of it to say, yes, I have tried a true truffle. Um, I guess they are very rich in flavor, but I, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't know. I haven't tried it. Okay. Um, but these are good examples of edible ascomycetes. Okay. Penicillium mold makes up um, the antibiotic, antibiotic penicillin, which all of us have, I'm sure, heard of. Um, that is type, a type of ascomycetes as well. And then some of these also gives flavor to certain cheeses, which is interesting. So some of these ascomycetes actually can give us um, flavor to some of the cheeses. And I'm thinking, I think it was. Blue cheese was one of them. Can't remember the other ones. Dang, what a great teacher I am, right? Um, but anyways, gosh, and I, I should refresh my memory before I go back and try and teach this again, right? But it's cool that um, a lot of these ascomycetes have actual uses for us, okay? Um, and then uh, there are also some of these yeasts are used to make bread rise, obviously ferment um, beer and wine. So there are some great uses for these things. Um, again, these are morels, and I think these are another kind of a delicatessen, which I've never had either. Okay, here's some other pictures. Um, again, here's some truffles. Now, if I saw that in the woods, I'm not sure if I'd be like, wow, this is worth a lot of money. I would think, eh, I don't know if I should pick that up because my dog might have left that. Oh, well. Um, so just some more pictures of those. Um, just some, another, these are still part of the Ascomycetes. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of give you guys some pictures of some crazy cool fungi. I think they're kind of cool. I mean, they're very 
different. Um, each each type of fungi is very unique in just um, small ways. I'm gonna show you guys some videos at the end. So those look really funky. Yeah, it's funky. Um, Tremella, I don't know what I would think if I saw that. I would think, wow, is that some living creature that's going to move and slither all over me? Nope, it's a fungi. And then we've seen that before, moldy orange, okay? And then penicillium. So those are all some examples of Astromycetes. Oh, Aspergillus as well. Okay, and this is kind of cool. Um, I wanted to, I just found this picture. I thought this was kind of cool. It says a fairy ring marks the perimeter of underground fungus. These mushrooms are the above ground sexual reproductive structure. So which is interesting that see this, there's kind of a perfect ring of these, um, you know, fungi, these mushrooms. So it's definitely that, uh, the kind of that my, mycorrhizae, the um, underneath that kind of root system that I talked about, that is basically all underneath there. And then um, the sexual reproductive, reproductive structure is all up on top. So it's kind of like it's marking its territory, so to speak. Um, okay, the phylum Basidiomycota. These are called the club fungi, okay? Most of um, these club fungi are mushrooms, puffballs, shelf mushrooms, stink horns, which is this weird thing. If I saw that, I might think that was a snake or something. Um, corn smut and wheat rust. What interesting names, right? But I guess when you, you know, put it all into fungi, and I guess you gotta get some weird names. So, during sexual reproduction, typically four basidiospores are produced on the tip of a club-shaped structure, the basidium, okay? So, let's talk a little bit about these. There's some characteristics of these fungi. Some are edible, while some are poisonous. Um, so, I have a video to show you guys in just a moment um, that kind of a guy was narrating about what's safe and what's not. It's kind of interesting. If you guys are ever interested, I did um, a search on in Wikipedia, which I know isn't always the best place to do your research, but nonetheless, I was doing some research on some of the um, poisonous mushrooms, and it's kind of fascinating what some of these mushrooms do. I mean, they are deadly. You know, we think of like, you know, with all the violence going on in this world right now, you know, a way to die quick is being shot. No, why don't you try one of these poisonous mushrooms? I mean, we're talking like within minutes you could die. So it's pretty crazy. So don't go around in the forest thinking that you can eat mushrooms. And I'm being serious about that because I know that some people, um, you know, have this tendency to just be like, oh, yeah, cool. Or, you know, maybe this is one of those special mushrooms, okay? Mm, not a smart thing, okay? So these are pictures of edible mushrooms. But there are some pictures, or these um, poisonous mushrooms, some of them can look very similar. So you'll see that in the um, thing I'm, I'm going to show you. This is an example of corn smut. Again, um, kind of a parasitic relationship that can destroy crops like crazy. But that is a fungi. Stem rust, which again can, um, you know, kill and harm plants. These are some of the gills and the mushrooms. Now, some mushrooms look very different. They have um, some have gills like that, and some are spongy, you know, so there's all sorts of different types of um, mushrooms. Okay, so let me show you these. I just want to show you just because. Um, mushrooms, again, super cool. How many of you guys are Avatar fans? I'm a huge Avatar fan. I loved the movie. I wish that I was a Navi and lived on Pandora because at nighttime it was so stinking cool, minus all those crazy creatures. But, um... There was some kind of lifelike, you know, realistic things there. And that means, and what I'm trying to say is that there are glow-in-the-dark mushrooms, you know. So, anyways, maybe we have a little bit of Pandora on our, um, on our planet. So, watch this video. It's kind of cool. I've got this one, and I want about poison, um, poisonous uh, mushrooms. So, watch this. Light-emitting mushrooms. There are mushrooms which can produce their own light. These mushrooms manufacture their soft, pleasant green light all by themselves. Scientists claim that there is still much that is unknown about bioluminescent mushrooms, but that's because they are trying to use the supposed logic of evolution to account for how and why mushrooms emit light. The fact is that the mushrooms know how to emit this light since the moment they are first created and act through Allah's inspiration. The light in bioluminescent mushrooms emerges as the result of some very complex chemical reactions. Bioluminescence 
comes about through the interaction of an enzyme called luciferin and the compound luciferin. These two compounds produce energy when they enter into reaction in the presence of oxygen and water, and that energy is reflected as light in the mushroom tissues. This type of light is known as cold light. In other words, it produces a very low amount of thermal radiation. These mushrooms are generally found in the tropical forest belt in Japan. They emit light for 24 hours and can clearly be seen when darkness falls. This light is visible from 40 meters away in some species. It is Allah, Lord of all things. Okay, so kind of cool, a um, little weird, trippy music behind there, but um, pretty cool that there are some mushrooms that actually emit light. I think that's very cool. Okay, so poisonous mushrooms. Um, again, there's some crazy poisonous mushrooms out there. This video that I was gonna, that I'm gonna show you, is not as informative as I would like it to be. But obviously, um, I couldn't find the perfect video. I should just make all of my own, right? No. Um, but if you guys are interested in this, just go to Wikipedia and even look up poisonous mushrooms, um, or catch some of the names. Um, there's one called the Death Angel. Um, so it's pretty cool to read about those. So watch this video and then we're about done. The bad and the deadly. <laughs> Mushrooms are good for us in many ways. They are an important part of nature, they're beautiful, they're great to eat, and they're healthy for us. But if you want to hunt them, cook them for yourself or others, or you just want to know what's growing in your yard, it's important to know about the poisonous ones. So if you're looking for edibles, this program will better prepare you to tell the difference between the edible species and the toxic ones, and will help you enjoy the good ones that you find. Now let's get some of the mushroom myths out of the way. If an animal can eat it, humans can too. Not true. Some animals are able to eat mushrooms and other fungi that would be deadly to us. Dogs are especially vulnerable because they're grazers and they often eat mushrooms if they find them. Keep in mind that some mushrooms that are mildly toxic to humans can be fatal to dogs or cats. Be very cautious about mushrooms that have been picked where herbicides or fungicides might have been used. Some fungi are very adept at absorbing toxic compounds, so it's recommended that you don't eat mushrooms picked near roadways or other suspicious locations. Even if it doesn't have a cap and stem and looks like an alien from outer space, it still might be a mushroom. There are no simple rules to tell if a mushroom is poisonous, but there are warning signs. Identifying characteristics of these amanitas include they have caps and stems and they don't grow on wood. They grow as single mushrooms on the ground, in the grass, or near trees. They have white gills which are not attached to the stem, and they have white spores. They also have a ring around the stem with a cup at the base. These are considered lookalikes to a classic favorite, the chanterelle. These are the real thing. This has real gills, not ridges, and the stem is generally much thinner. Psychoactive mushrooms have been a part of Mesoamerican culture and spirituality for hundreds and possibly thousands of years. Real psilocybes generally have a blue staining reaction in the stem and cap and have very dark spores. This beauty is one of the most commonly eaten toxic mushrooms. With all its reputation, you'd think that Amanita muscaria would be the deadliest mushroom in the world. It is not. The bottom line is this. We all need to respect nature. It can give life, and it can take it away as well. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the woods. All right, so you guys learned hopefully just a little bit about some of the poisonous mushrooms and versus some of the mushrooms that are not poisonous. Although that video doesn't give you a lot to go by, um, do your own research if you're interested. But we're almost done here. I wanted to quick touch on the mycorrhizas. Um, mycorrhizae means fungus root, okay? So 
Um, some fungi have this great root system, although it's still kind of a false root, um, they still have this, this root system. Hyphae from some of the fungi form a mutualistic relationship with the roots of some plants. So remember, mutualistic is both parties kind of um, basically do good from each other, okay? They, um, they, they grow well together. So most plants grow faster with mycorrhizae, especially in nutrient-poor soil. Fungi hyphae act as additional roots for the plant, and the plant provides carbohydrates to the fungus. So therefore, they both are mutually benefiting from each other. So it's kind of cool, okay? Um, mycorrhizae, again, are fungus associated with plant roots. The mutualism between, okay, so fungus, nutrient, water uptake for the plant, and the plant, carbohydrate for the fungus. So those are the two ways that they kind of benefit each other. There are several kinds of different mycorrhizae. Zygomycota, okay, is a hyphae that invade root cells. Ascomycota and basidiomycota hyphae, they invade the root, but they don't penetrate the cells. So they're a little bit different, okay? But they're very important ecologically, okay? So mycorrhizae, you'll actually find that um, if you notice some plants um, are actually, if you buy them from the store and you, you know, pull them out of their um, little container ready to plant them, they have uh, this mycorrhiza that's already kind of um, surrounded around them, and it's a great way to kind of keep that plant thriving. Um, lichens, okay, lichens are something that you guys have seen a lot on rocks, okay, so here's some common pictures of them. Again, there's a mutualism that is, um, you know, forms between the lichens and the fungus, so it can provide food, and the fungus provides that structure. Okay, so lichens are a very important form of kind of a fungus. The structure, again, kind of looks the same, or not, I'm not going to say the exact same, but similar to the mycorrhizae, where you have um, this algae here and then this lichen structure that kind of forms this web around it. Again, it's a very mutualistic kind of a, a relationship as well. And the last thing we're going to talk about is basically lichens can be used as biomonitors. Bio meaning life, so monitor of life. So some species are more sensitive than others to pollutants. So basically, um, when sometimes scientists can pick off some of this lichen and they can do different tests, and it will indicate the air quality because, again, those lichens are very sensitive to pollutants. They can kind of take them in as well, and they can be a good test for what the air quality is like in that area. So most resistant species can also be analyzed for different pollutants as well. So that's it for the fungi, but stay tuned and we'll talk about the kingdom Animalia.